In the beginning, God created a farmer. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then he separated the waters from the earth, and he said, let dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground land, land with arable soil, with all of the minerals and organic matter and nutrients and biota necessary to enable decomposition, germination, and root growth. And then God said, <clears throat> let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. God came up with the ever-renewing idea of seeds and plants, a self-propagating and ever-sustaining system of providing food to his world. Have you ever considered the mysteries of even just the mustard seed? And then God created mankind in his own image, and he said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And then God, over the course of history, taught us how to cultivate food, initially as hunters and gatherers, and then we settled down and became agriculturists. And over the ages, in ages, God gave wisdom to farmers and showed them how to grow wheat in its place, barley in its plot, and spelt in its field, writes the prophet Isaiah. God instructed them and taught them the right way, those farmers. Through the course of human history, God has inspired how we do agriculture. He gave the ancient Sumerians the idea of clay sickles. In the 19th century, he gave U.S. inventor Hiram Moore the idea of a combine. And even now and ever now, God gives us the diverse gifts of technology, engineering, biology, chemistry, and commerce so that we can further grow and distribute this gift for an increasingly hungry world. Through all of these things, over all of time, and in this very present time, God grew and is growing our capacity to grow food. God fed us. Again and again and again and again over history and everywhere and everywhere and everywhere in our lives right now, He is saying, they will be yours for food. As a society that has learned and cultivated the capacity to grow food and provide food to the world as well as we do, we image a God who does the exact same thing. Not perfectly. Because sometimes we over-industrialize and we go too far and we push the soil's capacity beyond what the soil can do. And we sometimes overspray or fertilize in the wrong way or cultivate in a less than best way. But where farming is undertaken in a right and balanced way, where it is beautiful and powerful and true, there is surely this God-given enterprise and everything that makes up this enterprise images him, your maker and your provider. Farmers image God. Over the past month, I've been reading the books of a man who's thought about this a lot longer than me. His name is Norman Wurzba. He's a professor at Duke Divinity School in the States. And then we dialogued via email, and he was so helpful in kind of bringing this city boy up to speed on some understanding of how farming works and how it fits and how theology and God connects to it all. So anything really smart I say, you could just see Norman whispering that into my ear in the next few minutes. 
As I read his work, I read it with a question in mind. How does a farmer uniquely image you, God? So he talked about all kinds of things, but I just kept asking. The, the, the farmer that he's talking about in this, end, how does that show us what your heart and mind and being is like, God? And I discovered that farmers image God in lots of beautiful ways. In Psalm 65, the psalmist says this to God, You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain. For so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with bounty on this Thanksgiving day. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. Dr. Wurzba writes, commenting on that passage, It is an important teaching of Scripture that God is intensely present to creation all the time as the source and the sustenance of its ongoing life. God is attentive to His world. I saw that attentiveness taking in the wheat harvest two weekends back, up on a combine, taking photos, perfect light, it was brilliant. I was wearing sandals. The father farmer was so, you know, an older guy, and you could, he'd seen his years in that combine and on the land, and was so weather aware and conscious and concerned. And the farmer, part-time farmer who goes to New Hope, Kenton, just knew about moisture content and taking in the crop and the right combine settings, which you have to get exactly right, otherwise you leave too much in the field or you destroy the grain as you take it in. And how do you maximize yield? And then the brother, who was so attentive to good seed storage and marketing and farm management and the beauty of his job and the land that God had given them. There's a certain depth that a wheat seed has to go into the ground in order to maximize yield. And sorry, Kenton, but like that one field, right? It went a little too deep and the yields dropped and it changed the outcome of the harvest. There's a certain depth. Harvest time, <clears throat> Kenton and I had made arrangements for me to come out for the harvest, so I said, well, let's book it a couple weeks ahead and let me know a time. <laughs> City boy. So I get a call on Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock. We're going out in about an hour. You wanna? I'm going, yikes, right? So head out to their farmland. There's a time and a place and a purpose for everything on the land, a time to plant and a time to uproot and harvest. Learn so much about God, you, through farmers. Learn that even as a farmer is attentively aware of so much that we city slickers, urbanites, cannot see, so much aware of all of that stuff that helps feed us, God is even more so aware of everything that's in behind everything that feeds you. God knows, Jesus said, that you need to eat. He cares about every detail when it comes to sustaining you and is an expert at providing for humanity's needs, at growing human lives so that they can flourish in His light. God totally gets that everything is interconnected and fits together. The idea of ecosystem is a natural reflection of God's interdependent nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Like, like a farmer, God gets that everything has to work together for everything to work maximally. Rain, nitrogen levels, equipment, labor, and price per bushel. God knows the give and take of interdependent systems. 
Our Heavenly Father makes room for the Son, and the Son makes room for the Spirit, and they together make room for the Father. They depend. A farmer depends on rain, <laughs> looking to the skies. That requires trust and humility. Believing that a harvest will come after I hear this morning you seek 200 grand into that land, <laughs> legalize gambling on the prairies in Alberta, believing that the harvest will come requires full submission in many ways to so many forces that are outside of your control. And the realization that you are but a small part of a very, very, very big thing. I'm not talking about the farmer. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about the farmer. You are not in control. A larger, sustaining, interdependent force is at work in the world, and every bite you take at your Thanksgiving meal, or did yesterday, or will today, or will tomorrow, is evidence of this fact. Every bite is loaded with history and power and sustaining providential love. And you can taste it and see that it's good for God to open your, your mouths and your taste buds and your eyes and your hearts to the truth. We fight giving up control and submitting to the bigness and the beauty and the majesty of a God who gives in that kind of way. We fight interdependence and ecosystems, farmers and industries. We fight against ecosystems. We fight against the land. We fight and don't want to depend. And when we do, we run into trouble. And when we submit, we find freedom. And when we fight, back into trouble. Very truly I tell you, Jesus said, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. If you die the death of giving up control of everything in your life, <laughs> and step into the freedom of the provider of all things for you, your family, your job, your wife, your friends, your community, your body, your health. If you die to those things, the, the, those things that keep you holding on so tight, Jesus had to enter the ground and die, so he practiced what he preached before there could be a harvest. He so trusted and depended on his rain-sending, sun-shining Father and the power of the Spirit that holds all things in every bit of earth and soil. He depended. Same for us if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. In order to really flourish, you need to give it all up. Submit and enter into the ecosystem. <clears throat> Just like Jesus entered into our ecosystem. Like a farmer, God was never afraid to get his hands and get his hands dirty. He got down on his knees and he worked the soil of humanity via Christ then, via Christ before Christ came, and via Christ now. As Dr. Wiersbe writes, God is the eternal gardener on his knees, holding the soil of our lives in his hands, breathing life into it day after day. I mean, if this is your story then he's put his spirit in you, planted the seed of something which is just drawing you to himself, to, to, 
germinate something in you and work its way up through darkness and then burst into the light of his photosynthetic presence and then flourish and grow. And out of the one seed that, that is you, a harvest, Dr. Wersba writes, as gardeners and farmers and all of us, the best that people can do is support the growth that comes from beyond their power and comprehension. Created in the image of God, humanity's highest calling is to witness to the hospitality that God first demonstrated in planting the world. And that applies to everything we grow and cultivate as human beings. They will be yours for food. Any farmer who's thought about it knows the mystery of how that comes to be. The question this Thanksgiving is, do you know the mystery of how everything, everything in your life is coming to be? let alone that food you'll eat later today. <clears throat> Are you or do you have any awareness of just how much goes on beneath the soil, within the depths of who you are and around you everywhere, and what God is growing in you? A beautiful quote comes from a writer named Kapek, was picked up in one of Norman's books. A gardener discovers that so much of life is unseen, going on in the dark ground, even in winter. Kapak observed that October is really the first spring month because the roots of healthy life are already embedded in the ground and so presuppose good soil preparation. Though vegetation has ceased to grow upward in autumn, life grows downward. We say that nature rests, yet she is working like mad. She has only shut up shop and pulled the shutters down, but behind them she's unpacking new goods. The shelves are becoming so full that they bend under the load. This is the real spring. What is not done now will not be done in April. Could it be in, in your darkness, in the place where you can't be sure of anything or know or see anything clearly, that in that place, the deepest germinating, getting ready for the spring, planning for God's future life, is playing out. So Thursday, I buried a new hoper, 39 years old. Uh, we did a funeral, and uh, two little kids, uh, Darren Sorella, don't know if you know him, nobody knows anybody at New Hope, but they've been here for about a year and a half. He came here years ago to do a CTV story on the church. He was the cameraman, the shooter, and then when his stepdaughter moved in, a year or so afterwards and said, I want to go to church. He said, I know of a church. And they ended up here. And then after about a year of being here, got the diagnosis of cancer and died last Friday. A little girl who's four, a little boy who's seven. And it was awful. There was a descriptor that was common throughout the Facebook posts and the funeral and the prayers, which started with the word F <laughs> and how messed up all of this was. Like a few years younger than you. And yet, there was a beauty and there was something hopeful still. Praying with him the day before he died. Are you afraid? Yes. For you? Yes. For the kids? Yes. 
You want me to pray? Yes. His testimony of faith, and we prayed. And there was something beautiful, still a saving that was happening, a resurrecting that was being pointed to. And a hope that what was already there on Thursday at McInnes and Holloway will one day be fully done. Yet for him and Sarah and the kids, but for you and for all of us, Could it be that in the darkness, God is doing this deep, deep work? And do you have any idea how frail and fallible and long but still relatively short in the scope of eternity your life really is going to be? I mean, it could be you next month, Ira. It could be me I sent all my notes exegeting Dr. Norman's book because I wanted him to see that I read it and I read it in a way that understood. And I said, are these all the ways that a farmer images God? And he said, yeah, those are good. But then he wrote this. What you lay out here is very good. One thing I would add that is especially important for urban consumers to understand is that God the farmer and human farmers are more finely attuned to life's vulnerability and fragility and also to the realities of death. We move through life with more impotence than we care to admit and more ignorance. This is why you are right to emphasize the need for humility. The framing of humility, however, can be difficult to pull off. I think the temptation is to romanticize farming and gardening, that kind of life, when in reality they are hard. We are being fed a script that life is meant to be this Hollywoodization, this advertised image of what it means to be a human being which does not honor and celebrate that life is hard at times and that, in fact, in those hard places you can find meaning and life and growth and things that are of the eternal. And the myth keeps us from believing that what we experience in those places is true or that God could possibly be there. They are hard. The exercise of care can be a bewildering, humbling, frustrating but also joyful task. Someone sent me that farm commercial about the nature of a farmer from the Super Bowl a couple years ago and just, yeah, all the down and dirty and hard and beautiful and difficult things that a farmer lives. And I thought they image a God who at times must be bewildered with you and who is humble and frustrated and filled with joy at where this world is ultimately going. So be thankful with every bite you take today. Understand that it's a testimony to the God who has put everything in place to feed, sustain, keep, love, and serve humbly serve you. I'm going to pray. God, your invitation to us in the Psalms is to taste and see that you are good. And we pray that this weekend, this Thanksgiving weekend, whether we are eating turkey or salad or fries, that you would help us to remember, to taste, 
and to experience your goodness in that tasting. And in also the reality of life being hard and sometimes confusing and frustrating, we pray that in experiencing true gratitude, you would also bring us to joy. The fruit of gratitude is joy, and we ask for your spirit to give us the capacity to be grateful and to experience joy, to pay attention and to know your presence with us. And we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who made this world for us. Amen.